podcast nemen. Goedenavond, uh, beste kijkers. Goedendag moet ik zeggen, beste kijkers. Het komend interview zal plaats hebben in het Engels. Maar deze introductie doe ik in het Nederlands. Tegenover mij zit Shawan Jabarin. Shawan Jabarin is directeur van Al-Hak. Al-Hak betekent het recht in het Arabisch. Al-Hak is een Palestijnse mensenrechtenorganisatie gevestigd in Ramallah op de westelijke Jordaanoever. Al-Hak is opgericht in 1979. Mr. Jabarin, welcome to the Netherlands and to this interview for the YouTube channel Café Welchmetz. Thank you, Anne. You're a human rights defender by passion and profession. And before we talk about the role of Al-Hak, your organization and your activities, I would like to connect shortly to you and to our viewers in a more personal way and also to make clear what's my position. Being myself the child of a Dutch Jewish couple that miraculously survived the attack on their very life and existence from 1940 till 1945, I came to realize later in life the utmost importance of defending human rights and the rule of law. My parents were helped to survive by courageous Dutch citizens who uphold human rights of their fellow Jewish citizens years before the fields of human rights became professionalized. I therefore do appreciate the professional work you do as an absolute prerequisite for ordinary people to live their everyday lives. Without human rights and without the rule of law, we are all vulnerable and dangerous can come from all sides. Uh, Mr. Jabarin, um, as an introduction to our viewers, if they hear human rights organization, they might think of Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, but they probably won't at first sight associate the concept with a Palestinian organization. Tell us, please, what's Al Haq? How big is it? Where is it stationed? What is its core business? What else does it do? In short, give us a kind of organizational profile. Thank you, Jan, for your introduction and for your question. And uh, what you said about yourself, it summarized, you know, the human rights defenders work, to be honest with you. Regarding Al Haq, Al Haq is the first human rights organization in the Middle East not just in Palestine. It was founded in 79. The idea uh, came, you know, to the mind of one of the Palestinian lawyers who studied in Cambridge and Oxford. And he came back, you know, with the idea about rule of law, human rights, international law, uh, all of these things. And he started, you know, thinking about what's going on in the occupied territory. And he felt that the occupation has no free hands to do what they want. And they have to be, you know, act according to their obligation under the international law. That's the main idea. And it was founded in 79. I joined Al-Haq in 1987, before the first intifada started, when I finished my school at Birzeit University at that time. At what university, sir? Birzeit, Birzeit University, university. in Ramallah. Yes. Area. And, uh, but before that also I used to contact Al-Haq when Al-Haq established, you know, in 8081, things like that. This is a long story. But uh, Al-Haq is uh, now working on West Bank, Gaza, including East Jerusalem, also in the occupied territory. It's mandate occupied territory. And, um, and uh, sorry and to interrupt you, but uh, you, uh, you say it's working in Gaza. Uh, you consider Gaza being occupied territory yes. as well? Yes, okay. sure. It's part of the occupied territory. And uh, since that time, we established, you know, the field work department, documentation department, to depend on the information that we gathered as the first hand data from the field on human rights violations. 
from <coughs> victims and eyewitnesses. We try to build, to build you know, a solid story, solid information, credible information, because the credibility, the professionality is the main capital for any organization if they want to sustain and to continue and to be gotten se serious. That's the case. So the first, the first department was monitoring department at al -Hak. And here, you know, we started documenting uh, human rights violations since the first days. Um, what, what I uh, hear you saying is that um, it's not only desk research, it's not uh, just al -Hak and uh, in an office, it's also field work. It's field work. And uh, now, for instance, we have t 10 field workers and the rest of West Bank, including East Jerusalem, yeah. and two in Gaza. That's two in Gaza. Yeah, yeah, two okay. in Gaza. Okay. And we computerized all of the information that we receive. We analyzed this information to study to see if there is a trend, for instance, behind the uh, violations or not. We are not just only tackling the individual and isolated cases and mm -hmm. separate cases. No, we try to look to see if there is a policy behind. Mm -hmm. Because of that, for instance, what I would like to say. Yes. If you take any of our publications published in 80s, 90s, yes. late 70s, yes. just you can make an update for that publication, which it means that violations is systematic. It's widespread practice. It's part of official policy. It's not an isolated incident. It's not just reactive. It's proactive. Occupation is proactive. It's not reactive. What you mean is um, when you study the files of the 80s and the 90s and you compare it with the current situation, you just have to update what you have written. Only when it comes to house demolitions, for instance, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, killings, uh, when it comes to restrictions on movement, when it comes to land confiscation, when it comes to the expansion of settlements, all of these things. Mm -hmm. For instance, <coughs> it's not an isolated incident. I see. And here, you know, here you can study what's this uh, practices, what's this violations means for Palestinians. Yes. And Another if you, thing is yeah. here, you are speaking about <clears throat> these days, you know, the size of Al-Haq is 40 staff members. 40 staff members, yes. and uh, including 10 field workers? Or? Including 10 field workers. Yes. Uh, part of them, they are lawyers, internationals, yes. and uh, locals. Uh, these days, you know, after Oslo, uh, Oslo is one of the main turning uh, points at that time. We studied also Oslo agreement uh, legally from the uh, legal perspective. Yeah. And we said clear words since the beginning. We said the main absent thing in this agreement yes. is human rights. The main absent thing in this agreement is international law. It didn't build on the basis of international law. And here, since the first days, we said that we concerned and we have a doubt that this agreement will be success. And we dealt with that, not politically, we dealt with that illegally, legally. Maybe it, was, it wasn't easy for anyone at that time to digest what we said. But these days, everyone go back to what we said since the beginning. Another thing is, <clears throat> uh, after the Palestinian established, Palestinian Authority established, we felt that there is a new thing here and there is a new body. And maybe it's easy for you, you know, to work uh, against the occupation and to collect data and people, they can uh, cooperate with you. They can help you here in the fields. The victims, they can open their minds and speaking to you openly. And we started documenting also the violations committed by the Palestinian side. Because when it comes to human rights violations, we are not selective. We are yes. not selective. And here we define okay. ourselves as a bird with two wings. One wing cover the Palestinian side, and one wing cover the occupation, the occupying power side. That's. And this is part of Al Haq. Our funding is from Europe, I can say 95% from Europe, 
at the beginning before you know at the early times it was from NGOs like uh, churches NGOs uh, humanitarian NGOs these days you know mostly it's from uh, European governments including also EU funding EU funding for al haq uh, we have a special consultative status at the ECOSOC at the United Nations which mm -hmm. allows us which allows us you know to address the human rights council allows us to address also the uh, special procedures allows us for instance to cooperate and to communicate with the treaty bodies uh, mm -hmm. sometimes also with the different committees uh, uh, at the UN uh, level uh, also beside also all of these things we are the Palestinian affiliate of the ICJ the international commission of jurists based in Geneva mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are uh, members in different uh, human rights international umbrellas like Federation International for Human Rights I am personally for instance also Secretary General of the uh, Federation International for Human Rights FIDH based in Paris and this is an international organization mm -hmm. I am also the executive uh, committee member of the International Commission of Jurists just I was as, elected as a, as a person yeah, yeah, just was elected, you know, just uh, last uh, October. Uh, this is, you know, part of the activity that uh, we do. So and the what, we what, what you do describe to me is an organization that has uh, that does field work with ten field workers that does desk, and legal research, legal research, desk work, uh, trying to monitor um, human rights violations, but uh, not only uh, of the occupation, but um, as you said, with two wings. You mirror the the Palestinian side, and you uh, mirror the Israeli side yes. of um, uh, upholding human rights or um, just uh, violating them. And you have an international outreach uh, in uh, Geneva and with the United Nations and with the International Committee of Jurists. You said <coughs> the International Commission of Jurists. So on three on three uh, levels <coughs> in the field, in the office in Ramallah and internationally. Yes, Is that correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. This is Thank indeed you. a organizational uh, profile. Um, well, we can't leave it out. Uh, we had the uh, Israeli elections uh, yesterday, and uh, I guess you expected me to ask you something about it. Uh, my question is very simple. The day after, is it business as usual for Al Haq? Does the outcome of the Israeli elections matter at all for Palestinians? Uh, look, we live in this uh, situation since uh, '67. You know, and uh, it's not new for us. Uh, other thing is the violations is continue and the atrocities committed by the uh, occupation and the occupying power, military intelligence settlers, uh, is a continuing a crime. It's not just you know after the election or before the election. Occupation is deepening during what's called it peace process. In my point of view, it's a process without peace. It was a process without peace because it was a time, I think, uh, for deepening the occupation. What exactly do you mean by this terminology, deepening the occupation? Comparing today with 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the settlers three times more than before, today, than mm -hmm. before. When it comes to land confiscation, three times more land confiscated during the last 25 years. When it comes to the separation, let me say, or let me say the building and deepening the system of the settlements is more than before. Now there is a wall. Now there are special roads for Israelis only. There are, you know, now uh, metal gates in every entrance in the Palestinian cities and villages and towns, which it means that they became, you know, Palestinian communities and community in West Bank became as uh, prisons, as a big prisons, that's the case. And uh, the movement restrictions isolated completely Jerusalem. It's not easy for the Palestinians and rest of West Bank to go to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They have to ask for permits, and the permits doesn't mean that the Israelis they guarantee permits uh, automatically. Uh, mostly, they denied your permits. 
to isolate that city and to say, this is our city, it's not your city. They separated completely between Gaza and West Bank. 25 years ago, there were around 40% of the students of Birzeit University from Gaza. Today, we have no one student from Gaza in the universities of West Bank. Mm -hmm. And there is no one student from West Bank in Gaza universities. Mm -hmm. which it means that they cut off completely mm -hmm. between West Bank and Gaza. They fragmenting Palestinian societies. They targeted the family unity. Today you are speaking about tens of thousands of families separated. Part of the family they are in uh, Gaza and the rest in West Bank and vice versa. Not allowed Others, to, they not are allowed to outside. visit each other? No, okay. no, no, no. Some people, you know, for instance, in, uh, in West Bank, they are from Gaza originally. They don't allow them to visit their uh, families in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of their family members, you know, they passed away. They participated and they shared, you know, their families just via uh, Skype or use the technology only. So deepening, deepening the occupation deep. means um, uh, more and more isolation for Palestinians, um, more and more settlers um, confiscating Palestinian lands, um, and uh, less possibilities for Palestinians, even less the, to, to travel freely or to visit families or to cross um, certain barriers. Beside, beside the natural resources that the Israeli taking for their interests and for their welfare, not for the protected persons' welfare, mm -hmm. not for the Palestinians, you know, under the occupation welfare, mm -hmm. nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And they sent Palestinians now as, you know, a people of beggars, you know, just depends on, depending on the uh, foreign aids. Okay. At the same time, the Israelis, they are pillaging from our natural resources around $8 billion directly from minerals of Dead Sea, from water, from land, Stone quarries. everything like that. That's what I meant by deepening the occupation. Okay. That's, That's what we meant, for instance, when we said long time ago, when we have been repeating this, that Israel, they annexed. You know, mm -hmm. there is a de facto annexation. Yes, I come to that you later, know. by the way. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, answering my question about the elections, nothing has changed uh, the day after. Um, there is no, uh, there is no change in the no, air there is a whatsoever. New one. No, there is a new one. There is a new one. And that is? The new one is the statement by uh, Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, clearly, directly, openly, that I will annex, yeah. you know, formally and by the jury, you know, the West Bank. Yeah. And even he mentioned at the beginning, you know, the settlements in the West Bank. That was what he said. And he said also, he said also, that we will not accept any Palestinian state Good. in West Bank. Yeah. Which it means that the things that we used to read, the things that we used to say before, mm -hmm have been saying that before all the time, that the Israeli plan not accepting Palestinian right to self-determination. Mm -hmm. They will not accept the Palestinian, you know, to exercise I... their self-determination. Now it said clearly. It said yeah. clearly. So what, what were your um, suspicions are now set in the open by the Israeli uh, leader, at least uh, during election time? I will come to that later. Um, uh, Israel, uh, as you know, um, and, uh, and you know it better than anyone else, is said to violate international law in many ways. Um, now, if you uh, highlight two violations that you consider particularly harmful to the Palestinian people, which two would that be? And another question, if you have to mention two successes for Al-Haq, which two successes would you mention, if asked for? Look, one of the main uh, problems, to be honest with you, is the destruction and the confiscation of the Palestinian property, mainly land. Second one is the restrictions on movement for goods 
and four persons in West Bank and Gaza within the occupied territory and outside of the occupied territory because Israel is controlling every aspect and because of that they are now their uh, policy is to fragment Palestinian society and this is what they are doing they are fragmenting controlling pushing Palestinians outside of their country and just one hour ago I read about 30 Palestinians they died in sea in their way from Turkey to agree this is the case and all of them they are from Gaza Gaza seized Gaza in big prison and when people left Gaza you know their dream now to get out of this oppression mm -hmm. to get out of this prison big mm -hmm. prison and just one hour ago they declared that there are 30 Palestinians they died in the sea in their way to Europe Mm, in their way to a certain day. But uh, your, your answer to my question, what are the two biggest um, uh, human rights violations, uh, violations of international law, your answer is land confiscation and um, blockade of um, the, the free uh, stream of goods and persons. Those were your two yes. main this, this is violations of international main, law. The main you know, okay. violations yeah, and, a lot and more confiscation about... land for the settlements and yeah. settlers. So farmland. Now you are speaking about around 700,000 settlers in West Bank. Yeah, yeah. including Jerusalem. Including Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. And I also asked you... Um, about the two success. About uh, if, you, if you were asked for two successes for, uh, for Al-Haq, what would be your answer? <clears throat> Look, I think there are many successes, but we can't say that there are a genuine success because in our point of view, mm -hmm. success is if we can, you know, uh, make the occupation and the occupying power to abide by international law. That would be which a real we success. are far away from that. Okay. There is no success in that. There is no success in that main thing. But one of the main successes to make a human rights uh, culture and the human rights issue as part of the Palestinian culture, uh -huh. where you go these days in occupied territory, speak to old people, young people, you will listen and you will hear human rights and justice and international law in every word that the people they say to you. This concept of international law and abiding by international law was absent in Palestinian society before um, the founding of Al Haq. This yeah. was not an yeah, issue. Yeah, even even the term of a human rights yeah. it wasn't okay. exist anymore. So if you now, for instance, everyone speak about international law. Mm -hmm. Victims they are calling you know for justice according to the international law basis. So what you say are, is Al Haq has introduced a standard by which the Palestinians can measure and uh, evaluate the occupation, the, the standard of international law and of yes. human rights. And one of that success was because of that, we pushed the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. to accede it to the, all of the human rights treaties, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we pushed them also to accede it to the ICC statute, uh, you know, International yep. Criminal Court. Yes, the, the Rome Statute. Yes, yes. Yeah. that's, it was part of the success okay. of al -Haq. Another success was also, there are some pension funds. Yeah. There are some, you know, companies. Yeah. They left the business yeah. in uh, settlements. Yeah. The business of I occupation. Know. Yeah. That's the case. Yeah. I think, also, it's part of the success, even if it's a small success, but it sent a message that there are groups, there are people, there are companies, they are ready, you know, to respect and to implement, you know, and to act in a way, according to the obligation of international law. In a way, um, this is the same type of success that you mentioned uh, among the Palestinians themselves, you, what you are saying is we made them aware, we made the actors aware of the existence 
of international law and human rights and uh, uh, of the necessity to abide by international law. Yes. That is, okay, that but, is indeed a... But we still, yeah, uh, we have a main, main challenge. And the challenge is? One of the main challenges is yes. how to maintain hope in young people's minds. Speaking about young people, how do you maintain hope? This is one of the main challenges, to be honest with you, before us. For instance, now we are facing questions from people, victims, youngs, students. What's this international law means? Questions. You, you repeat facing. it. Yeah. You repeat it every yeah. day. Yeah. This is your narrative. Yeah. You try to give us a hope, mm -hmm. but you see, you know, the double standards. You see there is no implementation of this. There is no respect by the occupying power of the international law. And Palestine is a test for the international law. Mm -hmm. Palestine is a good example of the violations of international law. Mm -hmm. Where we are from that, mm -hmm. I think this is one of the main challenges that we are facing. Yeah, it's, we it's... try to give them and to maintain hope by saying, hey guys, look what's happened, for instance, with Rival. It's a Dutch company. Mm -hmm. It's left its equipments there, you mm -hmm. know, and left its work in the wall mm -hmm. after, you know, they discovered and after the case here, you know, in the Netherlands, yeah. they discovered mm -hmm. that this is illegal. This is in violation of the international law standards mm -hmm. to make a business from the occupation, from the illegal. Yeah, maybe I benefit, should, I should explain benefit. this a little bit to uh, our viewers. Um, Rival uh, is a company uh, renting cranes and other uh, equipment. Um, that serves building of the wall and all kind of other uh, activities by the occupying power and it's a Dutch company and what you said is uh, they have uh, left uh, the scene and this is one example you gave to your youngsters to say look what we do can have success but I understand the problem that if you are talking about international law and the young people see that international law is not um, uh, functioning in the case of Palestine, that they come to you and say, you are talking about international law, but we don't see it applied. And that is indeed a, quite a challenge. By the way, um, that is one of the things that makes Palestine for me an issue. If we fail as Western countries to maintain international law in Palestine, uh, it, is, uh, it will harm us as well, because international law is indivisible. We should maintain it in Palestine, and if we don't maintain it there, um, the door is open to, ma to not maintain it in any other place. And uh, this is remind me, Jan, with what My name the German... is Jan, but no, not Jan, but Jan, ja okay, uh, no, yeah. continue, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, with the uh, German uh, uh, religious person at that time, he made a statement which, when he said that uh, we're talking now about him. Martin. He's a German. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, he's part of the church at that time. Okay. He made a statement, became famous, his statement, when he said that when they came oh, yeah. after, you know, the Unionist, I, I didn't speak out. Yes. Because, yes, exactly. because <laughs> I was not, you know, Unionist. Yes. And when they came after, yeah. You know, the communists, I didn't speak out yes. because I felt that I wasn't, you know, communist. And when they came after me, you know, Jewish, mm -hmm. I didn't speak out because I wasn't Jew. Yeah. And when they came after me, there was nobody left. Nobody left to speak for me. And this is, I repeat this and I emphasize on this. Yes. I said, if you ignored what's going on sure. in Palestine and continue ignoring what's going on in Palestine, you have to feel that this is will come to you one day. And I think these days there are things like that coming to you when we see the right swings these days, those yeah. they try to even to change the game of the international law yeah. and the game of the diplomacy. Mm -hmm. by Trump's administration and others here in Europe and there. This is concerning. Yeah, definitely. This right, this is this right 
uh, right uh, wing winds are blowing all over the globe. Because Definitely. international law and yeah. the principles of international law yeah. came after a horrific yeah. troubles, mainly in Europe. And this is the lessons of that mm -hmm. experience, bad experience. This is the lessons and this is the answer. And these days, there is no respect, no implementation. This is concern. Mm -hmm. It has to concern everybody, I, not I, just I, Palestinians. I, I, I agree. Um, it's a slippery slope. And uh, if we don't stop um, problem areas from uh, Sli uh, from uh, gliding down this slippery slope, in the end, it will reach us. I, I, I have to agree. Um, Just two, yeah. two quick things. International yeah. Criminal Court, also, we look at it as a success, and we're still waiting to see, you know, and to maintain hope in victims' minds. Yeah. That's one of the main things. One of the main lessons we learned at Al Haq was. We have not just to continue speaking about international law as a sixty things, as a good things, as just theoretically. We have to go after the criminals without holding the criminals accountable. Mm -hmm. No way, no way for a change of their practices, their violations and their crimes. Yeah. Um, um... Uh, speaking about the uh, International Criminal Court, what I understood is that it takes a very long time and it's still in its uh, early stages, this um, inqu inqu inquiry by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, do you see any progress? Um, uh, are you informed about any progress or is it, uh, is it uh, bothering you? Uh, recently, the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, no, it was not the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it was um, uh, Bolton in the United States, mm. uh, directly threatened uh, the members of the International Criminal Court that if they would pursue um, uh, research on the American um, uh, actions in Afghanistan or uh, Israeli actions, he connected the two as far as I remember, then, the, then he would definitely come with measures to uh, make the work of the International Criminal Court um, more difficult and he would go after individual members of the Criminal Court, which was a real severe threat. Um, given the fact that um, the International Criminal Court is, um, let me say, uh, uh, not in the highest speed to do the research in Israel-Palestine, um, what are your expectations? Look, let me keep a hope, to be honest with you. Let me keep a hope and uh, to see, you know, how the International Criminal Court defend itself, because it's important, how yeah. to see its members defending it. I think uh, this is a big issue, what's, uh, you know, said by Bolton and Bombio. Uh, threatened means a threaten to the uh, you know, uh, a credible and uh, independent body. Of course, and yeah. the judiciary yeah, uh, sure. system. Sure. Uh, which it means that, hey guys, the American, I think, uh, message is, we... it's a time for uh, not rule of law, it's a time for jungle law. <laughs> uh, and this is, it has to concern everybody. And definitely. Obviously. Uh, I think uh, but it is I, not, hope, it, it, I keep it, hope that the uh, court will uh, proceed mm -hmm. and uh, it has to come out soon. It has to move from preliminary examination to the investigation on Palestine is, case. Is there a deadline for that? Uh, there is no deadline, but uh, I keep hope if we have full confidence of the independence of the okay. uh, and the courage the prosecutor of the okay. ICC and uh, its courage. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Uh, Israel pretends uh, to be a democracy led by the rule of law. Uh, it makes you expect that human rights organizations should be encouraged or maybe even subsidized by successive Israeli governments to further strengthen this image. But on the contrary, since several years, the Israeli government aggressively attacks and undermines human rights organizations that criticize its occupation and violations of Palestinian rights. Now, in doing so, the government is aided by national <coughs> nationalist organizations 
such as uh, Israel American NGO Monitor, or by the Dutch Israel Lobby Organization, CD. And we come to speak about CD later. But first, why is Al Haq as a human rights organization among the key targets for Israel? And second question in this respect, are you working with other organizations to fend off these threats? Look, uh, as I mentioned, uh, since the establishment of Al Haq, the Israelis, they haven't challenged our information and our analysis. They haven't, you say? I challenge them if they have anything to challenge our information. Mm -hmm. To improve and it. our analysis. <laughs> yes. Because of that, they become furious because they know well what it means to build the credibility on the international level, mm -hmm. to speak out and publicly and strongly about their crimes, mm -hmm. and to engage with the international mechanisms about their crimes. And you push for accountability, pushing mm -hmm. for accountability in the Israeli eyes. I mean the officials here, not the Israelis in general. I'm speaking about the government. It means that you crossed the red lines. Mm. And to cross the red lines, this is one of the main lessons that we learned during our long time in the field of human rights. Without going after the criminals and holding them accountable, no way for any progress of a human rights okay. on now the field. Speaking about that, yeah. that's why the Israelis, you know, now they are trying, you know, to go after Al Haq and let me say to undermine the work of Al Haq and to smear, you know, to carry out smear campaigns against Al Haq and the others, though, those they are working with, with us. But uh, keep in your mind, work in human rights field, it's not a job. For you, when you defend rule of law, the human rights, the values of justice, the principles of justice, for you it's not a job. It's belief, it's faith. You do believe about it because also you look at the future. You look for your children also. I'm that's sure. that's what it means for me. Yeah, I agree. That is what I it agree. means for me. You know, when I joined Al Haq, yeah. I used to have open doors to go and to join other things, to make other business. But I decided to go to join Al Haq okay. for its work. Well, you're, you, what you're just saying reminds me of uh, words uh, by uh, Richard Falk. You, you must mm -hmm. know him. Yeah, I know him well. Um, he um, said about international law, that's my secular belief. It's my secular belief. And I completely agree with that. International law, human rights is indeed a secular belief. It's what you were saying as well. Um, speaking about that, um, we are all the time speaking about the Israeli side. But in the beginning, you explained to me that Al Haq has two wings. You also monitor um, the de facto uh, government of uh, Gaza, uh, meaning Hamas, and you also monitor the Palestinian Authority. Um, for the balance, and because it's a part of uh, Al Haq, um, could you tell me something uh, about this work um, regarding Palestinian Authority, Palestinian government? violating human rights of Palestinians and what you can do about it. Can you hold them accountable? Um, what does this work um, on the Palestinian side imply for, for Al Haq? Look, uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, we are not selective mm -hmm. when it comes to human rights violations. <clears throat> and uh, here in this case, uh, we document, we advocate, we speaking loudly, even in one case, we wrote to the European countries to stop funding the Palestinian security at that time, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. This is what we said. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's not easy sometimes to say that in the face of the uh, local and domestic authority in the eyes of the people and the others. But we stood behind that principally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We address that to the TVs, also to the uh, media. 
uh, we speak uh, openly and we say this is a violation of human rights. Mm. And uh, this is a crime when it comes to torture, for instance, torturing Palestinians. This is, this is, this is a crime against humanity. Definitely, definitely, we, no we, doubt. We, we can't, for instance, silence and we can't, for no. instance, uh, ignore no. uh, these but things. But how does, how does the Palestinian side react? Look, the Palestinian people now, they uh, disappointed, to be honest with you. I, I, don't, I don't mean the Palestinian people, but now I'm just speaking about the official um, Palestinian bodies like the PA and uh, no, there Hamas. Is a big how do discussion. they rea they no, react when, a big you, discussion. when you say this is violation of international law of human rights? If you say, are you treated, regarded as a kind of uh, traitor or is it said to you, you shouldn't speak about that, it is internal, you should uh, orient yourself to the, to the occupying mixed. force? It's mixed. It's mixed. But at the same time, they know that, for instance, Al-Haq have been working even before the PA established. And they know that we are working and principally, we are standing in principally before, you know, after, you know, behind the uh, human rights. Mm -hmm. We are not selective and we are not afraid and we have no that fear. Because of that, they don't attack us. You know, they engage, you know, with us. Sometimes they listen to us. And now there is a discussion within, you know, the Palestinian Authority. There is a discussion with Hamas, for instance, lately, when they attacked, you know, the demonstrators. Yes. Yeah, when they beaten them. Yes. We spoke loudly about that. Okay. They didn't say anything, you know, regarding what we said, because they know that we build our uh, statement on the information that we documented from the field. And when we speak about, <coughs> against, you know, the PA, for instance, and West Bank, about violations, they know that we have documentation. We, for instance, we sent to the president, Mahmoud Abbas, we sent him a CD, where <coughs> the title of that CD called Letter to the President. It's about, you know, torture. Five cases they spoke in that CD. It's documentary. We sent it to him. Mm -hmm. We sent it to the Prime Minister and the others. That's what we say. We speak loudly, publicly, openly for everything, and we try to tackle all of these things. Mm -hmm. So that is a... Um a, uh, you try to maintain an independent position and to uh, apply international law um, uh, without taking into account whom you are addressing, yes. or it's Palestinian yes. or Israelis, it's international law and that should be above parties. Nevertheless, um, there is a trend called a politicization, politic politicization of, of international law and uh, the, the best example of it. Uh, is um, the the concept of, if you may call it a concept, uh, the idea of lawfare. You are accused, al haq is accused, uh, international rights lawyers are accused of waging lawfare. Um, <clears throat> can you first explain to the viewers what is meant by this terminology and then say what is your opinion about it? Look, uh uh, I think uh, it comes from uh, warfare. Of course. Yeah, it comes from warfare. And uh, the Israeli, they are expertise to give uh, labels for labeling things. And uh, sometimes, you know, I ask myself uh, what they mean by this. Uh, sometimes I feel proud that I use law, you know, in the face of crimes and uh, atrocities and uh, oppressive regime. Uh, if they don't want us to use law, the peaceful means and legal means, what they want us to use. We don't feel shy. We don't feel shame to use law. We have to use law. And we have to ask and continue asking for the implementation of law. Yeah. Because if there is no law, yeah. there is another thing. Violence. And we do believe about law. We do believe about legal means. We do believe about peaceful means to solve the problems. Okay. The Israelis, they don't believe about all of these things. Because if they do believe about it, let them implement it. Let them respect it. That's... Let's them apply it. 
but they do believe about violence. They do be believe about, you know, silencing anyone try to address them. If Al-Haq tomorrow say that Israel is great, the occupation is great, no, there is no violations of international law. Israel is, you know, they don't violate international law. The Israelis, they will nominate us for Nobel Prize. Mm. Tomorrow, they will nominate for us. <laughs> and I think if the Israelis say that Al-Haq is doing good work, there is something wrong that we do as Al-Haq. Because okay. the criminals, they don't, you know, accept justice. The criminals, they don't accept to hold them accountable for their crimes. They won't Give me one criminal, you know, respect the court and respect the prosecutor and respect the case against him. Well, in, in politics, they definitely will not go out of free will to, um, to the court to ask the court to judge what they did. But uh, coming back to, um, to uh, lawfare, um, as I understand the term terminology, First of all, it's indeed a label to, to make it suspicious what you are doing, um, uh, 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 you, you're trying to apply law uh, to, um, uh, to, to cases and to crimes. Uh, so uh, you are in a way um, uh, treated as if you do something illegal by trying to apply law. That is the first thing that is meant by lawfare. Of course, it refers to warfare. And the second thing is that uh, it suggests that you are one-sided, that you select um, certain parties or certain uh, actions to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to counter them with law and that you uh, let go others. Now you try to explain to me that you have two wings, the Israeli wing, so to say, of Al-Haq and the Palestinian wing, uh, so this idea of one-sidedness uh, is, uh, to my opinion, not um, uh, not correct. Look, uh, my, bus my business is not uh, to think all the time how to come balance. For me, balance ah, means... What it means balance take, for you? What does it to mean? To take the side of the victims, to in, defend in the rights case. and the principles. Okay. That's, that's what it means for me, yeah. balance, and what it means for me the professionality and the work. To add weight to not, the victims. We are not shamed to take the side of the victims. Okay. In, That's in, any case. Case. in any case. Okay. In any case. Okay. Um, now, you already told me that you do have uh, field researchers. Yes. Um, and in times of war or attack, uh, it's of utmost importance to collect data on the spot by qualified researchers as close to location and as soon after the events as possible. We know that from Human Rights Watch in Iraq and in mm. Syria, for example. Is Al-Haq indeed prepared for these situations that unfortunately do happen too often in your region? I mean, when war breaks out, um, although it's officially not a war, but when Israel attacks, for example, Gaza, as it did in 2008-9, in 2012, in 2014, um, is it possible for Al-Haq to, to do this field research? Do you have enough um, resources? Um, how do you do it? Uh, is it not too dangerous for the field researchers? Uh, can you really collect the data in a, uh, in, in a, uh, in a way that, that, that sustains the, the case? Is it possible? Yes. <clears throat> Look, we trained well. Yeah. We have a long experience. We are the most experienced organization in the region. Because of that, we train also others. You do we train trained, others? We train Syrians. We trained Iraqis. We trained in different uh, places in the region how to document the human rights violations yes. according the international standards. Okay. This is what we do. We train, we invest a lot in our field workers, how to train them yes. in a professional way. Okay. And we find our own ways to get also the information and to reach, you know, on spot. Sometimes we put ourselves in danger. Our colleagues, for instance, in Gaza, they used to go and to move from, you know, uh, hospital to another places on the ground and the Israeli shells and the attacks, it was over of their heads. That's the case. They were in danger, to be honest with you. 
And uh, I would like to draw your attention late, you know, to the late, uh, lat latest uh, report that we did uh, according the killing of uh, one of the Palestinian medics. He's 17, 17 years old in Adhesha refugee camp in West Bank near Bethlehem. Uh, just read it. Two days ago, we released it, our report. It's called, you know, the investigation report. That's what we did. It's 18 pages, including all the documents, pictures, uh, statements by the Israelis, our documentation, our affidavits, all of these things. Because of that, even international organizations, they depend on our information, on our uh, affidavits, and our testimonies that we are taking Could from. You, can you explain the, for the viewer what is an affidavit? Look, affidavits affidavit. is the testimonies we are taking from the victims or the eyewitnesses. That's first-hand data. That's what we try to do. Not something, oh, I hear it here. Not from no, 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 hearsay, not but from, no, no. eyewitness reports. Yeah, yeah, eyewitnesses reports and victims, you know, those they were, you know, uh, it's... yeah, themselves. That's uh, the issue. And now we have uh, tens of thousands of testimonies. We have a big, big data bank. Mm. Because of that, even, you know, when Human Rights Watch, for instance, issued their report on the Palestinian torture, you know, against the Palestinian, against yeah. PA, for instance. Yeah. They used to depend on our information. Okay. We give them the information okay, to uh, Human Rights Watch, to Amnesty International, to others. That's the case. That's uh, uh, another question. Uh, because I, I because of that, the Israelis, they are afraid and they have fear from our professionality, from our credibility, and from the information that we have. And in the same time, they know that it's not a job for us. Even if they try to distribute the fear, you know, we will not, you know, fight. Okay. No. And, and you know, of course, that lots of people do support, if not um, directly, but at least um, uh, in, in, in their uh, outlook, uh, uh, the work you do. Um, you, you bring me to another question I, I had. Um, you were telling me that you uh, delivered information to Human Rights Watch and to, to Amnesty, you said. Um, um, what about um, uh, some of the big uh, Israeli um, human rights organizations, like, uh, for example, uh, B'Tselem? Do you cooperate with these organizations, or are you just a standalone organization and not cooperating with other uh, organizations working in the field we of have, human rights? We have a daily cooperation with daily. them. Yeah, we exchange with them information, cooperation. Sometimes when we set, let me say, training for our field workers, we invite their field workers. We have a good relations with them. We okay. examine the information that we have, they have. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, we received until now five joint uh, human rights awards uh, with B'Tselem, Al-Haq and B'Tselem. Together. The late, together. The latest one was, uh, you know, the French uh, Republic yes, uh, Award for Human yes, Rights. Yes, yes. Jointly be, be, France, between France Al-Haq, yeah, and honored France you last, with, with last a, December. Yeah, yeah. honoured you with a, yeah. with a prize for, for your work. In next few days, I'm, I will be in a joint uh, advocacy mission uh, with the director of uh, B'Tselem. Okay. We go together, you know, in advocacy missions. Okay. That's okay. This, because, this because we are one in one boat. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> sailing the same sea um, um, uh, of, of human rights violations. Um, is is Batsyan the only one, or do you cooperate? No, no, no. We cooperate with, uh, with the most others, of with most, most of, of the Israeli yeah, yeah. yes NGOs a human rights, a human rights organization ori oriented to human rights. Okay. Um, uh, what I would like to know, what I would like to ask you, um, is. Um, uh, is this um, your Israel? No, let me first ask you something else. Um, you, you were speaking about prizes you got. Um, uh, you got a Dutch prize as well, the Geuze Penning. Yes, Geuze Penning. Geuze Penning. Jointly with uh, Bitsilum. Um, ten years ago, indeed, yes. together with Bitsilum. Um Could this happen again uh, in, in, in today's world? Um, uh, and, and what response does the work of Al Haq get nowadays in general? I mean, 10 years ago you got this Geuze Penny, uh, and we were speaking about a recent prize by France, but do you, do you have the idea that the type of work you do is um, uh, on the rise, or is it, uh, is it uh, 
uh, is it made suspicious by uh, the international uh, climate uh, concerning uh, human rights organizations? Look, uh, <coughs> I mean, I, I think... Uh, is there appreciation internationally? I think uh, recognition by uh, uh, international uh, organizations mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes uh, government it's increased. We feel that. Mm -hmm. Even if we feel in the same time that the human rights are under threat, and not just in Palestine, elsewhere. But uh, today the uh, internationals and the international community in different places, they are more aware about the danger of what the Israeli is doing. And I think the Israelis now, they are knocking their doors. They feel that it's not just a case of Palestine. They are interfering in the democratic societies in different means when they, for instance, go after other organizations to silence them, not to let them speak openly and to exercise their freedom of expression. When they go, for instance, after MAP UK, when they go after, let me say, uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, when they go after Norwegian People's Aid, when they go after Amnesty International, when they go after this and this and this, a Human Rights Watch and others, and they try to label them that they are not professional and they have you know, which called anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism. I think this is a way makes also many groups these days, mainly in Europe, to be aware more than before okay. about the danger of the Israeli strategies, you know, to go after, you know, the human rights organizations to silence them. It's not just a matter of al-Haq only or X organization in Israel, B'Tselem, or other organizations. No, anyone criticize Israeli practices and policies and the crimes and try to speak openly about rule of law became, you know, become as anti-Semitic. This is a label. I think this is will undermine the term anti-Semitic oh, by time. By mixing that you know, between anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism is an issue. It's an issue, and it's real issue, and mainly in Europe also. But when you mix that with the criticism of the practice of a state, yeah. I think this is, will undermine oh, yeah, this definitely. term and this issue. And this is a danger thing. Go and see who is the friends of Netanyahu in Europe. Mm -hmm. Just go and see. And I'm ready to accept. I'm ready to accept one, to say NGO monitor or anyone to say, oh, Al-Haq is doing this. This is wrong. We challenge their information. We challenge their... But when you come just with the propaganda and with the smear campaign and trying to undermine and using a huge resources and you build, you know, a special uh, ministry for that, uh, having like 288 million shekels, which amount... Uh, so what you say is you are open for factual criticism, but you do um, uh, definitely not accept the labeling of practices, let alone the labeling of being anti-Semitic. Well, let's, let's say to all of those, they criticize yeah. us, please yeah. give me just one Give me element. the facts. Okay. Give me facts. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Jabarin, Mr. Jabarin, I, I have a personal question. Um, uh, but um, that might touch on uh, sensibilities, so I feel free. Um, you were held by uh, the Israelis in administrative detention. Yes. Yes. Meaning uh, being held as a prisoner without any formal accusation, which is common practice. Uh, and it goes totally against even the most rudimentary uh, concept of the rule of law. Uh, and you were even subjected to inhumane treatment, if not torture. 
Uh, in the 1990, Amnesty International adopted you as a prisoner of conscience. And what role, if any, and how has this, uh, if you allow me, uh, traumatic experience played in your choice to promote human rights? <clears throat> Look, uh, it's not just happened in 1980s or 90s, even when I was a child. 17 years old at that time i was the only one who was ready to testify against the settler who killed palestinian female student she was next to me in the street when he shot by his pistol and he killed her that's in 79 78 i was at that time 17 years old I was ready to go to the Israeli police and to identify that one. They brought me hundreds of photos, the same photos, and they said this, 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 many times. And I went before what the court in Jerusalem. What do you mean with the photos? What do you mean? Photos, different settlers with the same shape, yeah. have beards, you had the to same identify beard. but I identified that person. I said, okay. this is the killer. Even from the same photos, you yes. could identify him? Yes. Okay. And brought him before a court. Yeah. And I was at the court. And I testified okay, against a soldier who killed, you know, a disabled person. Next to me also, at that time. A second me. case, you mean? Yeah, second case. So a separate I went to soldier. Tel yeah. Soldier. I went to Tel Aviv, you know, military court. And I testified against that soldier. When I was young at that time, after that, they arrested me. They tortured me. They tortured me severely, you know, at that time. And the main accusation was, you were in the demonstration. You used to throw stones. I will tell you, I was, but I didn't tell them. I was, and I was afraid that to tell them that I was there. Mm -hmm. That's, but this is part so not of the life. Testimony? Was, the, was the, the issue, but the fact that you were in a demonstration was the issue? Yes, yes. And to tell me, you know, I think they look at it as a big issue, you know. There is a young guy to come to testify against, you know, a soldier and against, you know, a settler. Mm -hmm. I have to keep silent as Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. So when, this... I, when I was young, I used to say the right thing and to stand behind justice and rights of the people and the side of victims. Since that time, this is part of my character. This is part of my culture. And my dream was to study medicine, not a human rights. And I got three scholarships, but they banned my travel when I was 18 years old because of my, you know, testimony before the court. Since that time, you know, that's the case. Because of that, my faith with the human rights and justice and rule of law, even if I didn't know what it means theoretically, but that's part of my, okay. you know, beliefs. Because of that, I defend and I stand behind this. When I go to train the Palestinian, you know, police sometimes, I used to train them on a human rights issue and against torture, things like that. When I speak to them, part of them, they start to cry. I tell them, you know, this is my personal case also. That's when I defend against, you know, the, uh, uh, the torture and things like that. I feel it. I feel it. That's even it's a personal things. Because of that, when I decided to join Al-Haq, I joined Al-Haq and I used to have many things to do beside that. But I decided to come to Al-Haq and to start work as a field worker. I started with Al-Haq not as a general director. I started as a field worker in Hebron area. I documented cases, many cases, that's the case. In one of the, that case, you know, before the, even the massacre of Abraham, Mork, uh, Abraham Mosque in 94, at that time I wrote a newsletter to Al-Haq because I'm a field worker in the field and I see things and I see the settlers' violence and I felt it and I analyzed this in the newsletter and I said, massacre is coming. And my director came, he said, this is a strong word. I said, no, I will not change it massacre is coming and it came 
they arrested me. They put me under administrative uh, because Detention. at that time, yeah. you know, the uh, committee established, you know, to uh, investigate that incident. They brought what I wrote even before. I wrote it in December and the massacre happened in February, yeah. you know, two months after that. And they brought before them my report. They said, this is his report, our field worker, and this is what he wrote. Not because I am uh, a magic person. No, this is normal. It was in the normal. air. It was in the air. Because it's in the air. Yeah. That's the case. That's now what You're they... You're speaking about the, the massacre in the... And the uh, Ibrahim, in the, in the Ibrahim the mosque go, by Goldstein, you know, when yeah, he 29 killed, you know, 29 Palestinians. Yes. Yeah. But, but um, what you tell me is uh, different from uh, what I thought. You are telling me that uh, as a young man, you already had this uh, uh, great sense of injustice being done next to you. A person, an uh, innocent civilian person, Palestinian, being shot by a settler, another one being shot by, uh, by a soldier. And that was a thing that you wanted to testify about. So this means that from a very early stage, uh, as a young man, um, even not a man, but as a, as a young, young, young. Even at that time, I was a child. Y yeah, you were 17. You yeah. already had this feeling of injustice. Um, is it for you personally then uh, satisfying to, uh, to to do this work? I mean, um, sometimes a person has a profession, and when it ends, he says or she says, I "Would have done something else in my life, not this." If you look back uh, for now uh, on your career, uh, can you say this is really what is um, uh, what is uh, uh, what what I, what 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 uh, if if I would have a choice, um, I, I would choose the, I would, I would make choose the it again the, the make the same choice again. I I will choose it again and more than that, even more than before, for many reasons. Now I am not just interest of the Palestinian case. I now go outside. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, I was in Pakistan dealing with the, you know, I had, I was ahead of the mission to yeah. Pakistan yeah. to deal with the uh, death penalty of the minors. This is the second mission to Pakistan. I was in Egypt in different missions under the name of the ICJ international, uh, you know. J jurists. Yeah. yeah. Commission of Jurists and FIDH. That's, this is what I do, you know. It's not just Palestine, internationally. And I feel what it means injustice. I feel what it means suffering. I, 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 I feel what all of these things means. If tomorrow, you know, I finish and I have many other choices, I will go back to fight for human rights justice. Sure. That's the case. You know, that's the case. I know what the Israelis are doing, what they are saying, this smear campaign, all of this. I don't listen to that for one main reason, because I do believe about what I'm doing, you know. Okay. Another thing is, <clears throat> this is a long story. You know, they try to silence you. They try to dry your resources. They try to push you to the corner to say something else. And if we don't fight, strongly for justice and against oppressive regimes and oppression. No way to get a better and a good future for our children. I, I, I am I, defending my children too when I stand behind justice and rule of law. And I think it's a time, it's a time for everybody to stand. And if this occupation doesn't become costly, no way for them to change their policy. By uh, out of own free will, you mean? No. It's your... Sorry, I would like to thank you very much thank for you. your thank personal you. testimony. Thank you. And thank I think so much. these thank children you. have a great father in but, defending human but rights. But I keep a hope. To be honest with you, yeah. I keep a hope yeah. that the future is for justice and the future is for rule of law and the human rights. I share that And there hope. is no future for oppressive regime. No, this I is a lesson of the hope. history. This is the lessons but of the history. I share it, but Unfortunately, I, I'm not, with too, high price. not too optimistic of, for the near future. But yes, in the long run, I do share your hopes, definitely. I keep hope. And every day, you know, my colleagues and my board of directors ask me, what makes you, you know, become every day 
to the office from early morning and you stay working on this field. Yeah. What? What does I mean? say because I do believe about it and I'm defending and I'm building something for the future and the youngs, the mm -hmm. young generation. If I want to put myself aside and others put themselves aside, the catastrophe is coming. We are now in a catastrophe, but it will be more than what we are facing now. But we keep a hope and the future for justice and there is no future, you know, for oppressive regimes and for oppression. No way. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you.